Uh, it appears we have uh, that sound issue may have returned, so I will uh, use uh, the secondary mic until we get that uh, fixed. My guess is you all heard a rather loud noise. Apologies for that. Welcome to Overtime. So, uh, wow, yeah, uh, what's going on and where do we stand? Uh, what is it now? About six hours ago, slightly more than that, we reported that uh, what appears to be a revolution is occurring in Russia. I don't think revolution is necessarily the, the proper word, at least not yet. It's actually an attack. Uh, Wagner is a mercenary group paid for by Russia. They're not, you know, since they're not uh, Russian per se, if they decide to topple the Russian government, it's not a revolution. Whatever it is, Russia is now under attack by the Wagner military group. We know of at least one place where they've attacked, and uh, we believe now that that city has fallen. Quote, we'll discuss what that means in just a minute. Uh, we also have evidence that they are actually about halfway, at least some of their forces are halfway on their way to Russia. We believe Russia is about 12 hours from where the bulk of the Wagner forces uh, were first reported. So uh, we believe they've made some, they've captured some military assets uh, on the road about halfway there. We've got that in the center window there, and we'll be discussing that presently. Having said that, we are waiting. Sky News is reporting that they will be covering a speech, live speech given by uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. We uh, expect that at any moment. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're going live. Obviously, what he says is going to shape what happens uh, going forward dramatically. If he attempts to throw his own generals under the bus, it would indicate then that Prigozhin is actually working on behalf of Putin. And uh, what they will do is uh, get rid of the old guard in the Russian military. Putin will declare martial law and say that, yes, Ukraine was a failure, but it wasn't his fault. All of the generals lied to him. Everybody lied to him. And he has uh, gotten rid of them and corrected the situation. He will then probably leave Ukraine saying, well, uh, you know, this was uh, all the generals lying to me. This is their fault. That's why uh, this happened. And now that it's been corrected, Oops, my bad. Uh, that is one possibility in my view. That is the lesser possibility, more likely possibility. I th and there's reasons to believe it. Um, there's reasons that's a distinct possibility. Um, the other possibility is that this is an attempt to topple Putin as of yet. Uh, Prigozhin has not listed Putin as someone he's attempting to remove, he has essentially said that he wants to remove all of the um, uh, military structure. Whether or not he's including Putin in that is hard to say, but he has uh, named a number of people by name, Putin not among them. So it is distinctly possible, again, uh, and this was Macmillan's, this thought never crossed my mind, this was something that Macmillan suggested, is it's very possible we do know that... Um, Prigozhin has been very close to Putin and has skirted ever really coming out and criticizing Putin. So it is possible that um, he's actually doing this with Putin's support and that Putin sees this as his easiest way out of the uh, Ukraine crisis without getting himself killed. He removes his entire military and uh, blames them for it. If he simply does it, you know, just uh, rounds them all up and executes them, he's going to have a much bigger problem with the military. If it happens this way, maybe he gets out. Uh, so we'll see. Again, we are expecting to hear from Putin reasonably uh, soon. We, uh, we just don't know, but we've heard that he's going to be uh, speaking to the country. Uh, Commander McMillan explained to us that uh, what he says is going to be crucial in shaping Russia's reply to this and uh, our understanding of what's happening going forward. We uh, can now confirm, I think, for the most part, that they have, uh, the Wagner has um, entered and for all intents and purposes taken uh, Rostov. That is uh, this area right here. So this, this creates a whole... <laughs> This creates a whole new set of problems, and the reason being that if you think about this uh, from the Russian military perspective, uh, they are facing an attack from the West, from Ukraine, and now there is nowhere to fall back in the East. Uh, the, the 
admittedly that have to be have fallen back into Russian territory, but the first major city in Russia from Ukraine has now apparently fallen to Wagner. Wagner has seized the military headquarters in that city. Everybody is being told to stay indoors. We have video of uh, Prigozhin hanging out in front of uh, their uh, military HQ, and <clears throat> he has said. Uh, that he's actually going to stay there and wait until he gets the head of uh, the, uh, uh, or until he gets the defense minister uh, to surrender himself to him, uh, that he's not going to leave. We believe that that is likely not true and probably a deliberate misdirection. Literally, as he was saying that, a number of the um, uh, Wagner forces were spotted heading north. So this is the uh, town right here. Oh, there you go. Rostov, this is Rostov, and uh, let's see. Uh, there hasn't been much fighting there. They uh, they are, are as uh, incapable, it seems, of defending themselves as other Russian territories that uh, have seen incursions. The M4 is this road we told you about that goes directly to Moscow. Uh, we've seen a number of traffic alerts along that road. We also know that that road has been shut down by Russia in a great many places. Uh, uh, Russia has now set up checkpoints all around Moscow, but focusing in uh, on specifically on that road. Let's see here. This is um, okay. This is the uh, uh, Milirovo airfield, which apparently Wagner has seized. Uh, if that's the case, that means they now have, uh, and we don't know. I mean, Wagner is an international military force. Uh, it's a private military. They do have uh, some aircraft. I don't know if they're bringing that, those in or not. Uh, McMillan had pointed out that you know their most advanced troops can come from any number of places across the world, and they can now get them in there. It looks like this has been planned uh, reasonably well in advance. If so, uh, now that uh, they have that airfield, it's huh, there's a lot they could. Uh, possibly do. Let's see, we're going all the way up here. So this is, I believe, the midway point to Moscow. Um, small arms fire reported. Uh, and there is a truck on fire right here. There has been some combat in this area. The truck on fire, we believe, is actually civilian. It looks like the Russian um, uh, defense forces have been engaging any vehicles they find there, and they mistook a truck for Wagner Group. Uh, for Wagner uh, forces and uh, destroyed it from the air. Uh, at a minimum, it looks like uh, Moscow is attempting some form of defense and expecting that they will be attacked. Okay, now this may have been the midpoint. I apologize. Um, all right, this is... Um, I've forgotten the name of this town. Let me see if I can uh, magnify that. But they are, th in this city here, the Russian Defense Ministry has said that everyone has to stay in their homes. They're evacuating uh, element, uh, areas of this city. Um, there you go. Uh, Voriznia. That is that the midpoint? I think that's the midpoint. Yep, there you go. So... Uh, that city right here, there are reports that Wagner has already reached, at least elements of Wagner have reached it. We know they've reached the airport south of that. We don't know what reached means, by the way. It may be advanced forces, you know, it may be scouting forces, it may be small commando units. Uh, they haven't captured everything from there, but at a minimum, one thing this map does not reflect, in part because we don't have a color for it, I would assume, um, is that the, the um, Rostov does appear to have quote, fallen. And what I mean by that, there hasn't been any significant combat. The National Guard appears to have just retreated immediately, or not retreated, it was a rout, they just dropped everything and ran. But we uh, know that they have captured the headquarters of the uh, military there. They don't appear to be too preoccupied with civilian buildings, which means they're not trying to take over the government there. They have said that they will allow the military to continue its operations against Ukraine from there. This is a major hub for operations uh, in Ukraine. As one can imagine, it's the city closest to Ukraine. If they impede those uh, operations. It's going to stop a tremendous amount of the logistics. Let's uh, center that real quick so you can see. Um, uh, that that area is uh, sort of the center of 
getting everything that's not coming from Crimea up to uh, the uh, eastern side and western front of uh, the Russian invasion. So uh, having lost that, and I've got to tell you, uh, while they're permitting the flights to continue and the attacks to continue against Ukraine, and we believe the attacks have actually escalated dramatically, probably as uh, Commander McMillan had suggested to avoid uh, Ukraine trying to seize the advantage that this is going to give them. Nonetheless, uh, what Wagner has said they, they're, they're permitted to continue, but if you're a military there, there's now another military force hostile to your government occupying your city. So it's very hard to imagine how they're going to be able to continue any sort of logistical operations. I'd be very nervous doing it because they're, now they've, they've said, uh, Wagner has said that they're interested in replacing the, the entire government not the government, sorry, the uh, military command structure. They want to remove everybody at the top. They're not interested in engaging those at the um, uh, lower levels, though they've said they will if they have to. We believe, and I don't have the number of that handy, but at least one uh, battalion appears to have said that they will, um, that they're loyal to Prigozhin. If so, that unit, I believe, is actually already in Moscow. It's one of the Moscow defense units. If they're loyal to Prigozhin, things will get interesting. If they're loyal to Prigozhin, they probably would not want to say it or act on it right now because they're already in Moscow. They've got no backup, no support. But having said that, can do a tremendous amount. And if Prigozhin gets anywhere near Moscow, uh, just as the defenses start, they're going to get attacked from the inside. So uh, we don't know uh, a lot of rumors and speculation about all we know is, and so I'm going to check, uh, we're going to go hit Sky News right now. They have been covering. The uh, sub implosion, and we are expecting them to carry. Um, yeah, and Sky News is calling this a rebellion. I mean, I'm perfectly happy to call it that. It's just, I don't know how mercenaries rebel, but okay. Um, Putin is to make a televised address, and that's it. We are waking. Uh, we are waiting on the televised address. Sky News is saying they will be carrying that. Uh, so as soon as they have it, uh, we'll switch to that. Um, uh, Rostov is, yeah, it's where it's, uh, at a minimum, uh, if you're Ukraine right now, this is the best news you've heard in a very, very long time. Uh, the Russian military now has far more pressing problems than prosecuting the war in Ukraine. Uh, so anything you do is not likely to be a whole heck of a lot of resistance. So. As dawn breaks over there, uh, I think they're going to be, um, plans are going to change and they're going to move forward very, very rapidly. An opportunity uh, like this comes along only once in a lifetime. This here is Prigozhin. He is in, um, that is out front of the military headquarters in Rostov. Uh, so uh, as far as I can tell, that's pretty much confirmation that they have uh, gotten there. Uh, let's uh, I don't. I don't think this is captioned. So unless you speak Russian, I don't think we're going to know what he's saying. Thirty minutes утра под контролем военные объекты Ростова, в том числе аэродром, самолеты, которые уходят для боевой работы. Saying my Russian is very rusty, but I believe he gave the time. Uh, he timestamped it and then uh, said that they are in control in Rostov. Уходят штатно. Проблем никаких нету. Санитарные борта уходят. Проблем нет. Все, что делается, это мы взяли под контроль, чтобы штурмовая авиация не наносила удары по нам, а наносила по украинцам. Главный штаб управления, главный пункт управления работает в штатном режиме. Проблем никаких нет, ни один офицер не оторван. Поэтому, когда вам будут рассказывать о том, что ЧВК Вагнер помешала работе, И поэтому на фронте что-то посыпалось, на фронте посыпалось не поэтому. Когда мы пришли сюда, то мы еще раз подтвердили много новое. Огромное количество территорий потеряно. Солдат убитых в три в четыре раза больше, чем это в документах подается наверх. А то, что подается, это в 10 раз меньше, чем говорят по телевизору. Санитарные потери в день составляют некоторые дни до тысячи человек. Это убитые, без вести пропавшие, раненые и так называемые отказники, которые отказываются не потому, что они струсили, я уже говорил, а потому что у них выхода нет, боеприпасов нет, управления нет. Начальник генерального штаба 
бежал отсюда, как только узнал о том, что мы подходим к зданию. All right, uh, Gio, yeah, that was very amusing having said that. Uh, at the moment, we really absolutely need only legitimately. So uh, thank you for that. But we're in the middle of um, uh, a live show with a great deal going on. Um, have a link that can be helpful. I appreciate it. Other than that, I think uh, perhaps uh, save it for the meme section. Um, all right, so we are waiting on Sky News, who uh, we believe has... Um, uh, has said that they will be covering his uh, speech live. All right. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm honestly not kidding, Gio. Thank you, though. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, I'm a little behind where I wished to be. Apologize for that. Uh, so uh, let me... What I'm going to do in just a moment is we're going to do a rundown, and um, I want to see, like I said, okay, yeah, we'll do a rundown and we'll cover, all right, uh, Vosner, all right, let's see where that is on the map. I need to get a copy of the map that, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, Putin is usually very, yeah, well, my suspicion is Putin's got a lot on his mind, so I believe that's this town right here. So, um, Borizhne, is that the one we're talking about? Um, I, I, I mean, the thing that, um, the, uh, the one that I saw that I thought was really funny, what was it, the hunt for bald October? Um, uh, we also have the cam footage. This is, okay, oh, that's, the, okay, that's what's halfway. Uh, all right, so, um. Where is it? All right. So, uh, and there was a question about bodies in uh, Rostov, and um, uh, uh, we don't know. We haven't heard of any. We haven't seen any. We know there was a limited small arms engagement. Uh, we know that the um, Russian National Defense Force was uh, essentially routed. They gave up. They left. Uh, Russia has uh, made up, so Prigozhin is making, um, Prigozhin is making um, outreaches towards members of the military, saying that they should join him, that he's fighting for them to overthrow a Russian military apparatus, which has wasted their lives and gotten them all killed. The Russian Defense Force has now come out and said that they understand completely why people have sided with Prigozhin. However, they've been lied to and are offering amnesty to any members of Wagner or any supporters of Prigozhin's military who uh, surrenders going forward. They've said it's it's completely understandable. I'd like to get a, a copy of the official statement, so let me see if I can find that. Uh, but it appears as if they are trying to get... Let's see... Um, all right, so the Russian Defense Ministry has said uh, you were tricked by Prigozhin's criminal gamble and um, participation in an armed insurgency. Many of your comrades from several detachments have already realized their mistake, asking for help in ensuring that they can be returned safely to their permanent bases. We have already provided such assistance to all of these fighters and comrades. Please show discretion and get in touch with a representative from the Russian Ministry of Defense or law enforcement agencies as soon as possible. We guarantee everyone's safety. Now, uh, this message would have to be made under basically any and all um, scenarios in what we're seeing here. Uh, I'm tempted to say it suggests that they are having, in fact, defections. Because if they're not having defections, why say this? Well, you say this either way, because if somebody's thinking about defecting, uh, this already uh, gets ahead of it. They've said that they've already corrected a number of people who've been trying to defect. That may or may not be true. There's no way to know. Uh, it's certainly possible, uh, but uh, uh, we don't know, and they have every incentive to say it, whether it's true or not. So uh, at this point, let's see. Um, all right, yeah, apologies. Um, 
so, I'm sorry, trying to process multiple uh, pieces of information. I'd still like to get my mic working, but uh, at this point, that hasn't been a, a priority if we can uh, hear Putin speaking. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, so he is still expected to give his televised address. We also know uh, what we're learning now is it looks like the um, uh, family of, is it the prime minister, uh, the, um, the head of uh, Belarus has been evacuated. Uh, Lukashenko's family has taken off. Uh, they have turned off their transponders and um, are not visible specifically when going over Russia. Uh, this has been interpreted to suggest that they're concerned about uh, the Russians at this point. You'd be just as concerned uh, with uh, the Wagnerites, but the question is why is uh, Lukashenko evacuating his family at this particular point? Wagner has said that they are making other attacks. Uh, they have suggested that they are, and we have no evidence of this so far. Now, it, I will say this for him, he, uh, he is not a political person, uh, and he's not particularly conniving. He's a very direct man, and he says what he means, so I, I would find it slightly unlikely that he would be saying that they're doing all sorts of attacks that they're not doing, with the possible exception of just uh, throwing off you know, the Russian military, but he suggested that they're gonna, they are making other attacks from other uh, avenues out of Ukraine. We have not seen that. Uh, the one, let's see, it was in, um, uh, I've, forgotten, <clears throat> I've forgotten the name of the other one, uh, basically where the uh, uh, Russian Freedom Army attacked, that they would be going in that direction. The Russian Freedom Army has been very lukewarm about this. They appear to be concerned that if Lukashenko succeeds and overthrows the government in uh, Russia, that he would be at least as bad as Putin, so they are not necessarily supporting him. Uh, they don't appear to be opposed to him yet anyway, at least not from what I've seen. Um, so, uh, yeah, all right, thank you. Uh, so uh, that's it. I mean, that's um, actually, I say that's it as if that's, that's not very big. It looks like uh, we know that at least at a minimum they have recon that has penetrated at least halfway to uh, Russia, sorry, halfway to Moscow and apparently uh, all but unopposed. They appear to have taken Rostov all but unopposed. Uh, again, they're not replacing the military of Rostov, and one thing we need to remember is, again, Prigozhin's not really a political guy, so I don't, I don't know what his aspirations necessarily are. I don't know that he's got aspirations to rule Russia. I don't know that he doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> if he wants to, that's now on the table, at least making a stab at it. He has said he just wants to get rid of the entire military infrastructure, uh, the command structure of Russia. He thinks they're all criminals, and he uh, appears to want them all dead. So... <clears throat> Uh, either way, that's obviously uh, not particularly good for uh, for Putin. Now, there is a distinct possibility, and I, I mean genuinely distinct, um, which is that he has um, been actually doing this at the behest of Putin. We know that he is close to Putin, or at least has been. We know that Putin has uh, refused to pull the trigger on wiping them out, although he seems to have not been helping them a lot in the last uh, couple of months and caused significant damage uh, in not supplying them ammunition. But he also has not yet openly criticized Putin, and if you're going to do it, in my view, and I'm not an expert on this, uh, when you're invading the country is probably the time to do it. He has said that everybody in the government has lied. That would include Putin. Uh, and it seems very difficult to make the argument that he hasn't, at least indirectly, uh, gone after Putin politically. But there is a possibility that he goes, he basically kills or captures most of the generals. He then claims that he is a hero of Russia. Russia awards him some huge medal, and Putin sees this as his big way out, says, oh my God, you know, there was a huge conspiracy, but we have stopped it, especially thanks with Prigozhin's help. Uh, we've been lied to uh, about Ukraine. We have killed all the traitors to Russia, and we will leave Ukraine immediately. So that's his way out. Uh, that's a distinct possibility. I, I don't know. Even if that is the plan, that plan may not survive contact with <laughs> the execution uh, of it. It's uh, absolutely crazy. A lot is going on.
All right, so we are waiting. Um, that is not Vladimir Putin. Uh, so we'll <laughs> we'll we'll go back. I've been checking in um, <clears throat> with. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, yep. All right, we've been checking in with uh, Sky News. Uh, they are reportedly going to be <clears throat> covering the. Um, uh, Putin's speech live. What he says is going to very much tell us whether he's going to attempt to throw his own military, who ostensibly he needs now more than ever, under the bus, in which case we're looking at Wagner operating essentially at the behest of Putin to uh, expel all of the upper management, upper levels of the Russian military, or he's going to come out and uh, condemn uh, Wagner and demand that everybody uh, try to eliminate uh, Prigozhin and his group, in which case it looks like this is going to be essentially a, a fight to overthrow Moscow. We believe at this point 90% of the route to Moscow is clear. Uh, I don't see anything really stopping them. They have an air base. It looks like some air defenses have engaged. Oh, we don't have any confirmation that they've hit anything but civilian targets. So um, uh, that's where we stand. So what I'm going to do here, actually, let's see. Um, let's pause for a minute. I, I would like to try to fix my mic. And uh, there's a few other uh, pieces of information I want to get lined up. So we may just put the show um, in standby for a minute. No, that's also not him. Uh, and, yeah, all right. Uh, we're going to... And we're going to see if we can process the information we've got left and uh, see what we're expecting. But at this point, it looks like, at a minimum, they are about uh, the, the, the... At a minimum, they're... Recon forces are now about halfway to Russia. If they continue, uh, sorry, halfway to Russia, apologies, uh, halfway to Moscow. If they continue at this rate, they will uh, hit Russia probably in about six hours, which is along the lines of our Commander Millen's estimates. So I think that's what we're looking at. So let me um, wrap up one or two things. We are gonna, we're going to stay on air, but I would like to get a minute to try to uh, tabulate some of the information coming. We are also um, checking with Sky News. So uh, as soon as we have anything from them and as soon as we have uh, more material, we will let you know. Either way, we should be back in about five or ten minutes with uh, some more information for you. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, you can also check on the Discord where we're following this. Um, and uh, we will be back in a minute. Thank you.
All right. Uh, I thought we had repaired the audio. Uh, I'm going to switch over to the audio. By, it may be bad, so I'd like to get a sound check on this. No, I'm going to assume the audio has failed. So we're going to we're going to stay with the backup here. <laughs> Apologies. Um, we have uh, reports now that Putin has spoken. It was actually a pre-recorded message, so he uh, wasn't speaking live. Uh, a lot of people have been asking sort of what is the status of Putin? Uh, what do we know about him? Uh, and that everyone was concerned because nobody had seen him, which of course is exactly what happens. Like, oh my God, did somebody take him out? That's always what happens when these things start. That's why making uh, a statement as soon as possible is so important. He has a statement. I don't uh, know what it is. I have not seen it yet. I have not heard it, nor do I even know if it is in English. So what you see in the center is Sky News. Um, this aired just moments ago. So we are going to, um, it's a very short uh, pre-recorded message. Uh, so let's see uh, what we've got here. Um, and we should be catching up uh, momentarily uh, with that. The head of Russia's mercenary Wagner Group claims to have captured Russia's military headquarters in the south of the country as he's accused of trying to stage a coup. Russian mercenary rebels appear to have taken control of a second town now as their apparent mutiny gathers momentum. We're going to take you straight to Moscow, uh, where we're hearing from President Putin in a this recorded address. Is heroic. And last night I spoke to the commander of the southern uh, uh, troops. This is a criminal, adventuristic campaign. It is equivalent to armed mutiny. Russia will defend itself and repel, repel this uh, inimical move. We are fighting for the life and the security of our citizens and our territorial integrity. It is a question of Russia's millennial history. This requires the unity of everyone and the consolidation of all elements. Everything has to be done in order to in order to put this danger to rest. It is an attempt to subvert us from inside. This is treason in the face of those uh, who are fighting on the front. This is an, a, a stab in the back of our troops and the people of Russia. Intrigues, clashes, and so on has led in the First World War to a tremendous uh, turmoil and uprest. And that uh, resulted in the tragedy of the First World War, and the Russians were the victims of that. And this was <coughs> affected by a number of opportunistic elements. We will not let this uh, be repeated. We will defend our motherland, including <coughs> overcoming a number of obstacles. This is treason and it is about the ambition of inimical forces. The heroes who uh, freed the areas, the occupied areas of uh, Ukraine, are trying to re-establish the hegemony, the domination of the uh, Russian territories. We are trying fighting against anarchy and uh, capitulation. 
This internal mutiny is a mortal blow to us. It is a blow to our people as a whole. And measures will be very hard. These people who are responsible will certainly be brought to justice on behalf of our people. The armed forces and other uh, force agencies have received instructions and restrictive measures have been taken in Moscow, Moscow region and lots of other regions. Sounds like the Trump. situation around Rostov remains, however, very complicated. As President of Russia and Commander in Chief, as a citizen of Russia, we are doing, I am doing everything to repel this attack and to ensure the freedom and security of our citizens. Those who are mutiny have, have betrayed Russia. And I urge anybody involved in it not to, uh, to, to cease any kind of participation in armed conflict. We will certainly defend what is here and uh, hallowed to the Russian people. President Putin. Um, all right, that was um, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. So let's see here, just on one second. So, um, Apologies, I'm I'm a little behind. So, uh, Joe, I just got your DMs, uh, serious mind. So I am uh, updating you on that. I appreciate it, and uh, yes, I would. So, um, sent that to you, Joe. If you are still there, apologies. I know I'm about a half hour late on that. So, um, uh, and uh, the green room is not yet open, but I will open that up. And if uh, you are available, you are more than welcome. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, well, we're going to see if um, Joe Serious Mind wants to come in. If so, uh, he's more than welcome. I've just got to set up. We didn't uh, we weren't set up to have uh, uh, guests coming in, so I'm just going to set that up right now, and uh, we'll bring him in and see what he has to say on the issue. And then I'm going to do a rundown of uh, it's it's been an interesting. Um, uh, let's see, it's been an interesting uh, uh, last uh, eight or nine hours. Uh, so, Joe, it looks like we do have you. Your camera is off, but I do have you. So if I could just get yeah. a sound check. And yeah, Hey, how's it going? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, actually, let me put my headset on. Um, I want to walk around a little bit. Uh all right, so you, you are live. We don't have your camera, but uh, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. And I actually believe right now also we're not sending you a signal so you can't see the show, but we've got your audio in, so uh, uh, everything uh, should be set with that. So uh, what are your thoughts? You had, you had uh, uh, messaged me earlier on this, and uh, we've obviously been covering this now for a little while. Uh, what are your thoughts <laughs> on what's going on? Well, I mean, I mean, it's the big surprise. I mean, it, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, obviously, we know that uh, Prigozhin and uh, um, Gerasimov and uh, uh, Shogu have been kind of arguing back and forth for months. Um, I guess it was just a matter of time before it came to a head. It's just that, you know, in spite of the fact that, you know, there was all the all the telegraphing there that it would happen, it's still kind of a shock when it actually happens. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the thing, the thing that is is interesting to me, um, and a lot of people may not be aware of this, but the, you know, part of the reason why uh, Wagner forces have been 
successful up to this point to whatever degree they have been is because I remember reading something recently that roughly 95% of Russia's ground forces are in Ukraine. So the only thing that's left are state security forces and they're, they're not like our national guard. Like our national guard is designed to basically round out the military and kind of fill the gaps in, uh, in, in the, in, in, in the, you know, the active army and they, and they've, you know, they fought in wars and everything. Their security forces are, kind of like advanced police forces they're really not designed uh to go up against uh tanks and stuff there there are some things around moscow that apparently on tv i've seen a, a few things where you know there's some armored vehicles um but you know but the way from frostov to moscow is relatively clear i mean the big the biggest thing that the wagner forces have to worry about is air power um but the thing is apparently um Wagner forces have captured a couple uh, airfields, so they may have some some air power now as well. So uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen there? I did see that in, in Voronezh, um, supposedly uh, the Russian uh, aviation uh, destroyed two uh, Prigozhin uh, vehicles, you know, Wagner vehicles uh, from you know air attacks from helicopters, um, and and there was a, uh, an MI8 uh, transport helicopter that was shot down by Wagner forces, supposedly, allegedly. Um, but uh, really, that's all that that's that's like I won't say that's all uh, Putin has, but that's the major force that that Putin has is is air assets. Um, he doesn't have much on the ground to 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 stand in the way. Well, and air assets alone ain't going to do it. Uh, if Vietnam showed nothing, it showed that uh, they're important. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was he's also said we, we, we were looking to, to see what Putin said so we could unpack what that means and really what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And I think what Putin said gave us a lot of insight, so we will get into that in a second. But one of the things that he has said is he is not deterred in any way whatsoever from continuing his war in Ukraine. Uh, we believe now <laughs> that... The, yeah, they have now made a statement. One of the Wagner um, uh, telegram channels has come out and said, all military who do not support the coup, they are calling it a coup at this point, might as well call it a coup. I've been trying to figure out a name. They're not, they're, they're mercenaries. It's not a coup, but okay, fine. Um, will be considered collaborators who sided with Ukrainians. So he is still considering uh, Ukraine the ultimate enemy and uh, uh, really wants to get rid of um, the the. Uh, Russian military that, uh, at least the leadership who he says has been lying, Putin could easily maneuver this into saying, and we suspected that this may in fact be what he's doing, into saying, oh my God, the the, the uh, defense ministry has been lying to me and to the Russian people for all this time. Uh, they knew that things wouldn't work in Russia. They betrayed Russia and then blame all of them for all his failures and then possibly even just pull out at that point and say, oh, you know, are bad. Uh, that doesn't appear to be uh, what he's doing. What do you take What do you um, take from the fact that A, Wagner is, is making it crystal clear they have every intention of continuing uh, the battle in Ukraine after this is over? And uh, what do you take from Putin's speech, if you heard it? Yeah, I mean, as far as as far as you know, con them, you know, talking about continuing, and part of that is, and, and as I think you had mentioned a little while ago, that uh, he has been very careful not to actually attack Putin personally. He's attacked all the lackeys and basically said that Putin was tricked into this. So I I don't know that he may be delusional. He may think that there's still a place for him, you know, if he takes out uh, uh, Garasimov and Shogu, but um, and and I think that. That statement about you know continuing to fight in Ukraine, I think that's for public consumption, so that this way the people that are in favor of of you know pulverizing Ukraine um, will not be deterred by him and say, mm -hmm. oh well, he still wants to do the mission. He just, he's and he's on Putin's side. He's just against the people that have uh, misled Putin. So uh, you know, I, I I I don't put too much stock in it. Other, I think it was a political statement. I mean, he he may mean that, but it, it it's it's largely for public consumption. That's a, a really good point. That's a very interesting point. So, um, uh, so the advice it sounds to me that you're saying that uh, to sort of our listeners is don't. Uh, it's possibly true. Uh, just because something has a good political uh, motivation doesn't mean it's false. But it's also he's got every reason to say it and no reason not to. So it's it's distinctly possible that if he were to successful. I mean, at, at this point, it does look an awful lot like he's trying to overthrow. Um, uh, Russia. Uh, he, he and you're 
right. I think it's very important that he seems to have bifurcated uh, Putin from the rest of what he's doing here, but we don't know. It's certainly, from what I'm seeing on the ground, he's going straight to Moscow. So, uh, but, uh, so, you, uh, it, wild speculation here. I'm aware, probably hmm. unfair, but you've been on air before. You know I love to ask unfair questions. Um, let's assume he gets to Moscow. Let's assume he takes control. What do you think he does next? Well, see, that's the thing, and that's where he, here's the weird part. Because, like I said, he I think he's delusional in thinking that there's a place for him after this. Mm-hmm. But the funny part is, he still might. Because here's the problem for Putin. Like I said, if his p- piddly forces can't hold w- Wagner back, and and uh, Wagner is able to seize control. Yep. Then P- Prigozhin is the one that's bargaining from the position of strength, and then he could say, "Hey, look, I'll let you save face, and and stay in power, but I, but I'm in, I'm I'm your basically right hand man from now on, and you're not going to be dealing with these other people." You know, again, it's a long shot, but I, I it's Russia, so nothing's <laughs> impossible. <laughs> it's Russia. They, I mean, it's such a it's such a bizarre place. Um, you know, and and everything is machinations. Everything is, you know, that's that's the thing about a. I mean, look, there's corruption in every society, right? But there's certain societies built around corruption, <laughs> yeah. and as a result, there's all sorts of weird dealings that go on that you know could never really truly happen in most other places. That it could happen there. Um, so you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past him to to be able to survive this somehow. But he'd have to, to basically, he'd have to be able to take control. In which case, then, because then, because then, you remember too that then, then Putin has the choice of either fleeing, <laughs> running away, and, and where is yeah. he going to go for exile? Because most of his allies have not really supported him, um, or or basically working out some deal. Well, that's uh, I, I I think that's. That strikes me as roughly along the lines of what uh, Commander McMillan had had said earlier. So uh, essentially, what you'd have? Well, no, I'm sorry, no, because there's there's salient differences, but it, it makes a lot of sense. So essentially, if he gets to Russia, he's basically conquered the Russian military, which a is not nearly as strong as people had, had thought anyway, but b is mostly deployed in Ukraine now, and as we've seen, right. cannot really defend the homeland. So he goes conquers um moscow and then and we know to he now and, and maybe you can rem, um, remind me of this so I'll, I'll ask you uh to, to give me some some uh, uh details on something that I've, I've forgotten maybe you remember the details better than i do but um he sure. goes and he says okay the military is gone i'm here you've got two choices which is you know you can continue to fight me even though your military is all but but gone in which case he's either got to flee or die or hand uh, the military over to me i'm in charge now and he's basically moved himself to the senior uh spot it which would would be one hell of a coup uh the interesting thing about that is he kind of attempted to work his way into that spot not that long ago i want to say about six months ago uh he had suggested that he be put in command of all russian military forces and this was a very bold suggestion but a number of people said you know given the fact that wagner is the only ones who seem to be making any progress that that may be uh not a bad idea and at the time since putin trusted them people said well maybe he's going to do this and then the consensus was yeah no because that's a lot of power to just suddenly give to a a mercenary Uh, i don't remember all the details of that do you uh, do you remember much about about that that i've i've it's said now basically all i remember about it yeah well i think you've basically covered it that that's that was pretty much he has been angling for this and that was kind of i think what happened is it started when um when uh, Gerasimov first started cutting off uh supplies to wagner um and see, here's the thing i remember at the time that there were a lot of people that were saying, "Well, Prigozhin's off base because everybody's getting, you know, no, no, no Russian unit is getting their full supplies. They're all getting roughly equal." But I, I've made the point to several uh, YouTubers that <sighs> splitting it equally is not smart because you have areas where you're doing mm-hmm. well and areas where you're not doing well, areas where you're on the offense and areas where you're on the defense, and. So you have to dole those supplies out in a way that is balanced based on your effort. 
um, and as opposed to just randomly, you know, it's 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 you know, it's just, it, we're not talking about you know soup in a soup kitchen to make sure everybody gets a bite. You know, we're talking about forces that are taking ground versus forces that are you know being static. You you don't dole it out so. So Prigozhin was pretty pissed off about that because it was hurting his forces and they were getting chewed up in, in Bakhmut. So um, that's when the bickering started, or at least when that's when it got public. And that's when, when he had said to, to uh, right around what you, know, what you were talking about, where he said, hey, look, he wants to put me in charge. And then, of course, you know, Gerasimov and Shogu, they don't like that because <laughs> that puts them out, outside the door. So that's when this, this has been going back and forth. And then it got, then it got worse. Um, so there was probably, there was probably a lot of behind the scenes going on that we didn't even know about before this you know, burst out into public. Um, and it's been getting, it's been ratcheting up for the last, what, four or five months. Um, and I, I kind of, I kind of wondered, you know, it was about three weeks ago when, uh, when, um, the Wagner forces started pulling out of Bakhmut and I was wondering, and then, then they said, oh, we we're actually pulling out of Ukraine entirely. I was mm. like, oh. Uh, well, that's suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> they they've got to go somewhere. I wonder where they're gonna. Uh, I, I I you know I sort of vaguely remember that as a fleeting thought, like, hey, wait a minute. But then I was like, nah. <laughs> I was, I was, oh dear lord. All right. So we do have we've got some good questions in the live chat, and um, I'm uh, gonna try to catch up with those. We also have a report that at least 180. Is unconfirmed, but it's uh, from two different sources now that 180 um, uh, guardsmen have surrendered uh, to Wagner. Uh, Wagner doesn't, to the best of my knowledge, have the ability to take uh, prisoners of war. Uh, all the prisoners that they captured were just going straight to uh, Russia. For them to deal with, Wagner is a mercenary group. It's not a country. But having said that, uh, the question uh, was also posed in the live chat, how well can they recruit uh, 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 Prigozhin is actually despised by the generals in in Russia because he is constantly talking about how uh, inadequate and inefficient they are and how just terrible and it's all their fault that everything's going wrong. But he's actually uh, uh, certainly uh, earned the loyalty of the Wagnerites and uh, presumably from a number of Russians. What do you know about the Russian military, at least at sort of the soldier level, their view of uh, uh, Prigozhin? Well, you know, and that's well, that's kind of how he's been able to continue to recruit, even at times when, you know, his losses were enormous. You know, like taking Bakhmut, I mean, they're talking about uh, 40,000 dead taking Bakhmut uh, and Wagner forces bore the brunt of it. This is another source of his of his consternation and, and his anger at the generals. Um, but the thing is, is that. The the leadership like just say the 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 upper echelon of the um, of the officers within uh, of the Wagner Group, they're veterans and they're actually pretty skilled and they know what they're doing, uh, and that's the reason why. If you look, think about the, what the last seven months, there's been almost no progress except around around uh, uh, Bakhmut and basically where the Wagner forces were fighting. So the only the Wagner were the only the only troops making any significant gains in the last seven months. Um, so that has stood out. And the thing is, is that, you know, the, the rank and file Russian soldier generally don't like their generals because their generals are, it's true. I mean, that's the thing. Wagner's, uh, has been right. I mean, that's the thing when he's talking about how badly the, the generals are running things, he's not wrong. And, yeah. and I think the guys at the bottom and know that. And so, um, there were some people who, uh, they did their tour in in Ukraine in the Russian army and went back home and then signed up for Wagner. So that tells you something right there. Um, you know, so uh, I think that that there's a decent chance that he can recruit people. Uh, the other thing too that just just to take a little side trip for a second, one thing that that's really important to note about taking the the southern military uh, uh, districts uh, headquarters, yep. that's where the war in Ukraine is being run out of right now and taking that headquarters um basically you know i i know he said he's not going to impede them but it can't not impede them you know what i'm saying you know because if, yeah. if, if the people that were normally there to be in control aren't in control it's going to hamper what they're doing plus the fact that you know that when it comes to supplies and resources whatever is available in that in that uh, oblast he's going to take for himself he's not going to send into ukraine 
And well, I, 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 that is a really good point. Uh, and I, I sort of mentioned earlier, at least that, you know, okay, so you're a Russian soldier, uh, you're there, it's been taken over by Wagner. And he says, oh, just continue your normal operations against Ukraine. I would not want to be wearing a Russian uniform in a area that's been captured by Wagner with the claims that they've been making what they say they're going to do. And I wouldn't want to go to work in the morning. So um, uh, right. now we know that they've continued their attacks. Well, I think that's another excellent point, which is that he's a military man, which means he is now in a, uh, uh, a city that is the central source of ammunition for the war in Ukraine. And he is sitting on it i'm not sure that just like oh go go and kill ukrainians is number one on his uh a priority list exactly all right so um we have a, a question about lukashenko so let's talk about what we know and i'd like to get your opinion on that uh to the best of our understanding it is lukashenko's family not lukashenko now it is entirely possible lukashenko is on that plane if I were Lukashenko and I wanted to get out, one way I might do it is say, oh, yes, my family, we're going to evacuate my family. They're all civilians, and they have one very large piece of luggage that has two feet and looks a lot like El Presidente, but, you know, <laughs> I I ignore that. Um, so I mean, that's the way to do it. That doesn't mean that's what's happened here. We have no evidence that Lukashenko has left. We do know his family has left, and that is also common, is to get your family out if you're expecting shit to go down it doesn't mean he's left we don't know the reason turkey has accepted them i would assume is because they are in fact civilians it is his family and he is not purported to be in the, on that plane we do know it has landed it is in turkey i also know that while nato could obviously bring pressure nato doesn't get to decide who lands in turkey and who does not so i think there's a lot to uh, unpack there and we'll get to that but to answer the question about lukashenko the latest update we have we have no word on where he is no evidence of where he is no evidence that anything bad has happened to him all we can confirm is that his family was put on a plane they uh left they did not go to their allies russia who just gave them all these nuclear weapons they went to a nato country turkey and that's where they are. Um, sir, uh, uh, Joe, what do you, um, what do you take from that news? Well, here, here, it's, I think it's a, it's a really uh, significant development, and it's, it's a lot more significant than people realize. I mean, yes, it is typical for, for people to get their families out of harm's way. You know, to, uh, you know, we would all do the same, right? But here's the thing: why does he think his family's in potentially in harm, what, harm's way? So that tells me that he's actually concerned about uh, about Russia unraveling because otherwise there's zero reason. I mean, he's in another totally another country. But and here's here's the other thing too that could be interesting with him. We know Lukashenko has been you know an adamant supporter of Putin and and basically been his lackey for 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 quite some time. Yep. But what's interesting, I remember seeing something like it was on. Um, the, the celebration day when they had the one tank where they usually have, you know, dozens yeah. and all that. I've, I've got to, I've somebody, I forget who, it was a great line. They're just like, hey, Russia's saved. Thank God they kept that one tank for the parade. That's what's going to be. So that one tank is right now <laughs> on the highway. That's that's where that's where uh, Wagner's exactly, headed. They've exactly. got their parade tank. But anyways, I'm sorry you were saying. But, but, but uh, so the thing is that, um, so wait. I remember, and I wish I could remember the exact context, but basically there was, I remember watching a bunch of clips and, and news reel and news articles and, and, um, and some YouTube videos on the fact that Lukashenko, like he, he gave, he made a perfunctory speech, but they were, they were a lot of videos showing him or basically it was very clear that he was nothing but a lackey and he looked unhappy. And now you could read too much into that, but on the other side, it's possible that maybe he doesn't like being a lackey, and he certainly wouldn't like being a lackey to a potential loser. Because again, you remember we're thinking about the the culture. Um, if he thinks that that uh, Putin may be on the way out, that's a dangerous situation for him because he 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 knows if Putin goes, he's got no friends. 
Well, his military, so his military, well, he, he's basically, Lukashenko is barely holding on to power. The, the people want to revolt right. against him. The only reason they haven't successfully done so is because he's got a military that's strong enough to keep him in power. But that military is supplied now basically by Russia and fed by Russia. And it's the reason they're getting nuclear weapons. And this is some. This is worth talking about briefly. Uh, it is, it's concerning that Belarus is getting nuclear weapons. Weapons should not be you know, proliferated to countries that don't need them, aren't going to use them. There's any number of concerns about that. But realistically speaking, it, while it feels like it's a huge threat to Ukraine, it's not. And the reason is because Russia can already strike basically anywhere on the planet they want to any time they want to. Adding tactical nukes in the vicinity of, of Belarus would only permit them to deploy some of those sooner in areas. Oh, your camera's on. I'll put you in in, in a sec. Um, uh, it would only allow them to deploy those sooner uh, and probably only by hours uh, to, to where they could deploy tactical nuclear weapons. It's not a, a, as scary as it sounds. It's just more proliferation. But the reason he did it was to tell the world, ah, oh, you see, this is my... Look Lukashenko is my best buddy. I trust him with nukes, and now he's a nuclear power, and he gets to say all these things. But if Russia is going to collapse, all of that is absolutely meaningless. So it strikes me as he thinks that there's a very real possibility Russia is in danger, and even if they're not, they're going to pull their troops that are helping him off of uh, Belarus to help themselves. So it looks like um, Belarus may also be in danger of collapsing. Do you think that's a, a, a fair statement? Oh, absolutely. And here's the other thing, too, to remember. Um, like, it, a lot of people were saying, oh, like, you made the comment a second ago, oh, Belarus is a nuclear power. See, the thing is, the nukes are in Belarus. Belarus doesn't have control of those nukes. There's Russian soldiers in in, uh, in, Be in uh, Belarus who are controlling those nukes. Um, so that's why I wasn't, I wasn't particularly concerned. I knew that was, that was posturing because they could put those they could put those in Korsk Oblast or in in uh, uh, Belgorod Oblast, and they'd be just as you know no more or less dangerous than where they are now. Um, but you know the fact that he's here's the thing as to why Turkey my my imagine you know my guess is again if if Putin falls then and and that's Putin Putin's his only real backer. He's not, you know, uh, he's not safe in Russia because he doesn't know who's going to be in charge yeah. and what they think. And so he that's why he's getting his family out, because here's the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm you know, again, I'm speculating. But you know, I think his calculation is if if, if shit hits the fan and he, he has yet, he, he would rather, rather face, face justice in a NATO country than in, in his own <laughs> or, or in um, or in Russia. Oh, dear Lord. That's that's. A statement. Uh, and that's the other thing that we see a lot of, of course, right, which is it's like when they actually want to see justice done, when they want to be treated fairly, where do they go? Um, yeah. Oh, dear Lord. Yeah. <sighs> well, well, that, well, that's the thing that's kind of funny. Like early on when when the invasion first happened and, of course, they, you know, Putin and, and his all his uh, surrogates were out there telling how 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 bad the West is and everything. And where all where do all their children live? Most of them live in, in the West. You know, a lot of them live in the U.S. or Canada, uh, U.K., Germany. So we were, we're so bad, but all your family lives here. So and go to school here. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to I guess uh, Galatian, uh, yes, I, I think if, if if Putin falls, I think it's very likely that uh, that um, Lukashenko falls as well. Um, that's really the only thing propping him up. And um, the thing the thing that's kind of weird about it, because again, there's a lot of Russian forces in in Belarus. Um, you know, they basically, I mean, the Russia, you know, the, whoever takes control in Russia could end up taking control in, in uh, Belarus. You know, you never know. It's, it's, it's hard to say. It's, that's why everybody's like freaking out, you know, because it's not that predictable. Again, it's Russia. Anything can happen. It's Belarus. Anything can happen. I'm actually going to switch that to, I think Belarus is, is, uh, they're each likely to fall. They could each fall independently, but Belarus is probably in more immediate trouble, or potentially. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, while there are no, there are revolutionaries in Belarus. They are trying to take over. And you're right. There's a Russian military in Belarus right now. That's one of the reasons Belarus has been stable. That military isn't going to stick around. They are being pulled to help defend the motherland. Uh, uh, Putin mm -hmm. cares more about the motherland than he does Belarus, and uh, Belashenko uh, is there knowing 
that all of his military support from Russia is going to vanish, not because they don't love him anymore, but because they have to defend their own homeland. So if you're in Belarus and you're trying to overthrow the country, the next right now isn't your moment, but it will be within the next 12 to 48 hours because the Russian military is almost certainly going to evacuate. Yeah, yeah my, my biggest concern overall um, about those nukes isn't any state actor. I'm not afraid, what, you know, because again, both Belarus really doesn't have control of them. Uh, even if they try to take control, I'm not really concerned, and I'm not, and definitely not concerned about the Russia having them. Um, it's really uh, non-state actors um, seizing the opportunity. That, to me, is the biggest threat. And so here's the thing that's really messed up. If Belarus falls and Russia is in turmoil and can't do anything about it and can't pull the nukes back themselves, you might see a NATO mission go in to to extract those nukes. Uh, it was kind of wild. That, yeah. there, there, there was there was actually a book I read in the late eighties, early nineties, um, called the Ten Thousand, and it was literally in that case it was actually Ukraine. It was basically the Soviet Union breaks up uh, the Ukrainian. Um, uh, 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 you know, non-state actors in Ukraine try to get hold of the, the, the nukes that Ukraine had at, at the time. And um, and basically NATO's like, you know, actually the U.S. says we can't have that because that's, you know, that's that's basically terrorists are going to get control of nukes and that's going to be the end of everything. So so the U.S. sends a force of 10,000 to go uh, into um into Ukraine to go extract those uh, those those nuclear weapons, and so they pass through Poland and they get there, and then and then part of the weird part is so they come back and they've got the nukes, and in the book the German German forces say well we, you know nukes aren't allowed, and basically then the German forces end up fighting the U.S. forces um, who are trying to extra, you know get out get out through Germany with the uh, with the weapons, but uh, but you know the premise though is there and it's been actually I think it's written in some other books as well the idea that one of the you know, like way back in the 90s it was a, any of the former Soviet republics which which Belarus is right uh, uh, so you know that could be that could be a, a serious problem if uh, if things go belly up so uh, I just want to really a uh, news update I've been following uh, on Twitter here. So Igor Shushko, which I'm not familiar with him, but he's posted a lot tonight. I don't know if you, don't know, if you know if you're familiar, but he's got pictures here. Russian soldiers surrendered en masse to Wagner PMC in Voronezh. Uh, so he now controls both Rostov and Voronezh uh, Oblast. Um, Wagner I'm, is now approaching Krasnodar oh, and oh, uh, Volgograd right. without, without any resistance. All right, so let's see where that is. So first of all, uh, some of that we know is accurate. Some of that is not. He does not control the Oblast. He is on his way, presumably. So this is, so on the map here, the initial um, incursion was um, in uh, uh, Rostov uh, right here, and uh, he is now apparently making his way north from there. There has now been what appears to be another incursion. We're not sure. Uh, Border right here. There was a surrender of, uh, of apparently a basically. I think it's a, a company. Um, uh, this it, these are the photos. I think that you were talking about. They yep, have that's that's them, yeah. uh, those are Russians. Yeah. Uh, we appear this is it, these appear to be genuine, and they have all surrendered to uh, Wagner at that point. So the question is, are they really going in? I mean, that doesn't look like a great point of entry to, to make it to try to. to take a, a city from there that may be he has said he has multiple points of entry the only one that we have found is um uh, rostov uh, down there in the south what were you gonna say well the thing is they were they i know that there was a yeah i saw other other videos earlier showing um wagner forces going up the main highway there uh was m uh, m4 um now uh but it, it is interesting because I mean, yeah, it's like you said, it's about a company. But it, it, you know, what I'm wondering if they if they if they surrender on mass, I'm wondering if they're defecting. You know, yeah. Because if they're defecting, then they they potentially add to his to his combat power. That's a very good question. Uh, now, a, a lot of the Russian army that's left is prisoners. These are people who've been conscripted and do not want to fight and, uh, and probably will not. Uh, even if it's to free the motherland. Having said that, there's a number left that are still loyal to military principles as we understand them that I, I assume we could draw from, so that's interesting. This is at the border, so basically they've, they've surrendered at the border. He at least has now an alternate. Mm. 
uh, route in. And I mean, if, if you're the Russian defense minister, your border agents are surrendering without a shot being fired to a hostile uh, military organization. I, do you think that the uh, free, uh, God, freedom, Russian Freedom Brigade, which is a small unit uh, of Russian military who have joined Ukraine, they have been fighting on the side of Ukraine and recently made incursions into Russia quite successfully. They have been very tepid about this and um, uh, said that they will fight any, any uh, dictator dictator, anybody in control of Russia, whether it's Putin or Prigozhin, uh, but they have not opposed it and they have not done anything else. What do you think they're thinking right now? And do you think they may get off the fence or they're just going to sit there for a little while longer? I, I think they're going to hedge their bets. Um, they're in a good spot right now. I mean, again, just to give, give you an idea of how weak the Russian state forces are, um, you know, we know they did a couple incursions and then left and went back in. They've been sitting in what eastern Belga Belgograd uh, uh, Oblast for what three weeks now, and no one's pushed them out. Um, <laughs> this is their new home. No one. They're just hanging out and and gathering their forces. So you know, and basically trying to recruit people. So the fact is, if that the Russians had the forces to defend their homeland, they would have pushed these guys out a week or two ago, and they haven't done it because they can't. Um, and so, and this is the thing, you know, uh, where, where the most dangerous part for, 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 um, Putin, and this is why I said how a deal in, in, in as weird as it seems, the reason why a deal between him and, and uh, Prigozhin is possible is because one of the things, the people who, the Russian people who support Putin, one of the things they like about him, they feel he's strong right? he puts a, the, he puts on the air of being strong. Remember like riding the horse shirtless and all this kind of crap. You know, he's very, you know, he, he, and, you know, it's no, it's no surprise he and Trump got along very well, you know, right wing oligarchs that, uh, that like to, you know, like to put on bullshit airs. But, um, this, if he, if, if, if uh, Putin can't stop this, then that, that myth go, is crushed and he's weak. And then the only way he can save face, like I said, if, if, if Progression says to him, hey, I can make this look like you were not at fault, like you weren't the weak one, that you were undermined by other people, and then that's how he can deal himself back in. Um, because, yeah, otherwise, Putin's done. Even, even if, even if Progression's, you know, I mean, here's, it's actually, here's the funny part. If Progression fails but does a lot of damage, that may actually hurt Putin worse. Because then he doesn't have to face everything. And now he just got egg on his face that, hey, how'd this guy get that far? You know, you're pro projecting that you're the second most powerful country in the, on the planet. Your army has been, you know, basically stuck for the last, you know, eight months, not going anywhere. And now you can't even defend the home. You know, and even, if, even if they stop him, look what it took you to have to stop this guy fighting against you. And he's weak. Um, so he actually, he actually, in a weird way, he may actually need Progosian to be successful weird a oh, while wow. yeah this is this is well th there's a lot to unpack here i would why i really appreciate you coming on by the way thank you very much um yeah so uh there's a, a great meme and it's true <laughs> what is it it's um you know the moment putin realizes that it's easier to travel um uh 10, 000, uh kilometers uh, to moscow than it is to travel two meters in bakhmut uh and it's true <laughs> they fought for every meter in bakhmut and uh, if that military can do that, now a lot of them didn't make it. But um, I'm curious about what other countries we've been talking about, uh, what other countries may do, what other people who have um, a stake in this in one way or another may do. It looks like um, Belarus is uh, preparing for the worst and, and preparing to bail entirely. Having said that, China has a stake in this. They've had a stake in this for a while. They reasonably early on, said, oh, we're best friends with Russia, there's no daylight between us, and then they're like, ah, except they can't use nukes, and they're not going to do this, they're not going to do that, and then they formed a peace plan that threw Russia under the bus. It was no good for Ukraine either. It was bad for both sides, but it was like, okay, Russia, you're going to have to stop committing genocide, and they're like, oh, what? Who are so, what? Yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, so, um, we know that there's contested territories between Russia and China. We know that right now Russia is in charge of those territories and has refused to pull troops from those territories to use in Ukraine on the grounds that if they do, there's a very real possibility that China will attempt to um, take those disputed territories back. If you're China right now, what are you thinking as this is happening? 
Um, well, and this is and this is something that I mentioned, you know, even last year, um, that you know when when we were looking at when the invasion first happened, and people were like, "Oh, well, Russia's army is so big," and not realizing, well, no, the ground forces were like two hundred seventy nine thousand at the time, um, not counting on the, all the call ups since then. But I said, "Look, they can't." evacuate all their forces from the rest of their borders. I mean, they've got borders with China, they got borders with India, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they got to protect them, you know, because they have, they've had you know, struggles with those countries in the past. And, uh, even though China is their friend on paper, you know, I, I got, are you familiar with Bo, the fifth column? Yes. Very you know, good, he, he made, yeah. he, he said something that, that I, I largely agree with, but I, I think there are a few exceptions. He, he said that country, countries don't have friends, they have interests. Now, I think there are some exceptions to that, but, mm. uh, you know, but it's largely true. And as much as, basically, China is an, as invested in Russia as it, as it needs to be for its own interests. And if those interests are, are change... Um, China will do something different, and and if if Russia becomes even weaker than they've been, and opens the door for China to take advantage, they will in a heartbeat. Uh, because we have, you know basically China is is seeing this as an opportunity to become the number two power. Yeah, they really kind of are now already. You know, yeah. people haven't acknowledged yeah. it, but they they are. Um, but they they want to expand that power. They want to. <sighs> They want to basically get to the point where they can basically be a credible threat to Thailand and basically a credible credible threat to the U.S. forces to say, hey, we're going to take Taiwan back in the U.S. You're not going to do anything about it because you're going to get too bloody. Um, and so every every little bit that they take is good for them and it's good for the for the propaganda back home. Right. Because, you know, if they're going to be expansionist. You can get away with being an expansionist if you're successful. And so every success you have kind of bolsters people. If you're if you're winning a lot, people will their objections seem to melt away. People <laughs> like a winner. Yeah, they, yeah it's yeah. it's amazing. It's amazing what you can get away with if you if you keep getting away with it. If you get what I mean, and you know if you if you try something, and you're successful. I, well, I I, mean, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't Trump know what you're talking about. But anyways, please continue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You you just hit it on the head. <laughs> Trump, Hitler, Hitler, Mussolini. You know every 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 bravado strong you know strong man who's ever uh, you know done anything uh, uh, vile. Uh, that's how they keep doing it. You know, that basically they do it, they get away with it and go, well, I'll just keep doing this until someone stops me. And the more they achieve, the harder it is to stop them. Uh, that's uh, uh, Trump has that one thing, right. Um, and he's sort of suggested at it before, but doesn't talk about it too much, which is the assumption that you're right. And the assumption that anyone who disagrees with you is a complete idiot. And the assumption that you are, you just are incapable of screwing anything up goes a long way towards committing that to reality in the minds of people. <laughs> That's usually what you, it doesn't have to be true. They just have to think it is. And it, it, it's been an amazing thing to watch and see that that's as true in the U S as it is anywhere else. It's unfortunate, but it yeah, just... I mean, I mean the thing, the thing that well, here, here's the thing that's kind of interesting. I don't mean, I noticed a long time ago, people, like the illusion of choice but they don't they don't really like choice that much they like they, they like mm. to feel that they have choices but here's the thing when you make a choice you're taking responsibility for something or you because you're taking on culpability for something and you know i even think about like you know the the gulf war ii you know um with the invasion of iraq 70% of the population was in favor of that at the time. And then later, when it obviously didn't go so well, then there was all these people that, oh, well, these people that voted for it or didn't stop it, they should have known. I'm like, and I, I remember arguing with a couple people and said, well, what was your position at the time? Well, I was for it. Like, well, then you're mad at these other guys because they were politicians who had to, who basically did what you wanted them to do. But, you know. Um, but now you're angry at them because it didn't go well. If it had gone well, you'd be, you'd have been perfectly fine with it. Um, and I always knew, I always knew I didn't like them, but I knew that this was the way to, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just think basically people, most people are full of shit. I mean, we're all full of shit to a, at various times, but some people are full of shit more often. <laughs> um, so 
we're we're gonna. Well, I, but, think, but I was want to oh, say please, real please. quick though. Yes, the, the, the 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 thing you pointed out that that's the strength of of dictators. Yeah. It's also their weakness. Uh, something that I, I had a, a conversation with a friend of mine years ago, and we were talking about. He said because we, we, it was back around the time when Abu Ghraib was revealed, and we found out all the you know heinous shit that was going on in our name. And I made the point, you know, and so my friend was against it. Um, and, but we were talking about it and we were talking about a mutual friend that was coming up with all sorts of, all manner of excuses for it. Cause he's a Republican. And so he was going to make excuses for anything that Bush did. And I said, look, you know, and I, the point I was trying to make to our mutual friend is that we say that we're the good guys. Okay. Let's, whether you can, we can, we can debate that, but just pretend it's true for a second. Well, what makes you the good guy is not your motivations. Oftentimes it's often is your methods. And the problem that was a big, a big thing that was a big problem at the time is that there were a lot of Republicans that would say, well, well, the enemy does these things, so therefore it's okay. And I said, well, you can't, on the one hand, argue that they're bad people because they do X, Y, and Z, and then say we're okay to do it because they do it. I mean, if they're bad for doing it, then we're bad, at least as bad for doing it. And I would argue if you know better that something's bad and you do it anyway, that's worse. Um, but uh, so... And I said, that's the thing. So that's really very often the difference, you know, it, it, between good and evil is, is, mo is what you're willing, what methods you're willing to do to achieve your goals. And so he said to me, so I said, the good has a better, has a higher standard to uphold. And he says, how in history, how is the, how are forces of good ever won when the bad guys could always just do heinous shit and kill babies and, and do all, all, all sorts of, uh, of uh, atrocities. And I said, well, it really comes down to hubris. Because if you take it, if you have people like guys like Putin, Trump, you know, Hitler, you know, Mussolini, you know, and, you know Pol Pot, any of them, you name any of them, people who basically have no limits because the people around them keep doing what they want, even if they don't agree, but they're either afraid to or they're lackeys or whatever how it is, and they go along and they do these things. At a certain point, you start to believe your own hype, and you start to believe that you're better, smarter than you really are. And I mean, if you look at the history of World War II, for instance, it's replete with ridiculous, stupid, strategic or tactical mistakes that Hitler made because he was he thought he was brilliant and nobody had the stones to tell him no. And if he had left it to the generals, who knows? I mean, chances are they probably would have lost, but it might have taken a couple more years for the for the war. But because he was an arrogant prick. Uh, and and wasn't as as crafty as he thought he was. He made a he made a lot of really bad mistakes that hurt his own cause. Um, and that I think you find that pretty much all over the place. And and you may be seeing this now with Putin, right? This whole invasion. He thought this was his moment of glory that he's going to capture all these places and he's going to look so great. And he's eviscerated the Russian army, and now he looks very weak that he can't even defend his own home territory. Um, I, I, I think that's very much a uh, nail on the head and the, the, um, the, one of the reasons, I mean, one of the reasons Hitler was so successful as well, and it was because he was ignoring the advice of his generals and said, don't do this, don't do this. And then he did things that were so unbelievably stupid. Everybody was like, did that just happen? Did that just, <laughs> they just let him go. That's, by the way, that was Trump at the beginning when Trump would come out and say, obviously criminal things live on television nobody arrested him because they're like do we, do we arrest someone for saying admitting it on television but um yeah, yeah. oh dear lord i think you could do it we have to do a show just on the psychology of that uh, we're going to start to wrap it up yeah. um reminder to people uh you know we worked very hard to get this information to you early if you like it share it with friends tell uh tell people and let them know i think uh you know i'm very proud of the reporting that we've done and that's been with the help of a lot of people oh uh, so yeah. I'm just curious. So I saw somebody tag Ukraine Matters. Is Ukraine Matters in the chat? Uh, I watch his channel. George, uh, I watch yeah, his yeah. channel every day. Yeah, George is a, uh, George is a good guy. I, I like him. I, if he's in yeah. the chat, welcome. Um, so, and we've we've um, would love to have him on for Starsky. I get behind and, and don't notify him on time, so it's kind of my fault that he hasn't been able to to make it on. Would love to see him on. So, um, I, yeah. I do have a question. Uh, one last question before we go, but again, like, subscribe. It really helps the channel, and, and it's uh, 
in order for us to be able to, to do all these things, we need support from you guys, and you guys have been marvelous, and I'm, I'd like to say thank you, and, and uh, we appreciate it. So, uh, and keeping it up really does help. The uh, the other question I, I want to ask, okay, we've gotten the perspective now of uh, a few other countries. We know Ukraine is probably going to jump on this opportunity. It is a huge opportunity for them, so expect the... Um, even if they haven't finished their probing attacks and decided where they're going to go, they may just go. They may just, they've, they've held back, we believe, about 70 to 80% of their forces uh, that are capable of attacking along the front lines have actually held back while they finish probing and figure out where. So expect uh, a massive attack uh, coming uh, very soon there to take advantage of this. It looks like Wagner may be attacking from other areas. It also looks like they're about halfway up. Belarus looks like now it's anticipating a problem sufficient enough to uh, threaten the life of uh, Lukashenko and or his family. His family is evacuated to Turkey. Uh, so we've talked about uh, China, a few other countries that have a vested interest that may decide to move on this and are, are obviously weighing their options. Um, the one side we haven't talked about is uh, Russian military on the front lines right now. And while I assume that every effort is being made by Russia to hide all of this, uh, the Ukraine military is making it uh, <laughs> very easy for the Ukrainians to access, uh, sorry, for the Russians to access as much of this information as possible. Um, mm. uh, what do you think this does both to uh, commanders who are in uh, Ukraine who are trying to prepare for this uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive or dealing with it now, and what do you think it does to uh, Russian soldiers who are here uh, listening to this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to do a lot. I mean, and it's going to do a lot of different things because you figure there's going to be some people out there that are on those on those front lines that are totally um, loyal to Putin, think he's great, think that what they're doing is great. Um, and I could see that group of people doing actually doing two two different things. Some of them doing some some of them that are going to want to just redouble their efforts and fight really hard and hold the line and all that. There's some that are going to want to run home and it's like, oh, we got to really save the motherland now and go back and fight fight for uh, Then there's the the um, the people who are not so loyal to Putin who are stuck out there and are thinking, you know, they I mean, they're doing their job because they're afraid of uh, the, um, what do you call it, you know, the brigades that basically stand back and shoot you if you run, um, who, uh, who uh, might uh, actually decide, uh, 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 yeah, blocking the units, that they it might actually be worth to take their chances against them or, or to surrender. Um, so, and, and we know, like, well, like I said, I suspect, despite uh, Prigozhin's word that he's not going to interrupt the operations going into Ukraine, I don't believe him. I think the the uh, the um, it's too it's too easy for him again to pinch off the best of the supplies and material for his own use, um, especially since it was a sore point for him anyway. And uh, so I think that you're going to see logistics. If nothing else, the communications center for, for that was there. If, if, if that's interrupted in any way, I mean, as it is, the Russian forces are, are built around top down control that, you know, they don't have a lot of control at, yes. the, at, the, at the bottom level. And, and this is really going to eat their forces up because if, if the Ukrainians do jump off and start hitting, there's not going to be anyone to tell these guys what, what to do. And it's going to be a mess for them. Um, so I, I think it's going to be chaos. And uh, we know that supplies have already been a problem in the south, in, in uh, Zaporizhia, and uh, and uh, uh, what's left of the Kherson Oblast and all that. And it's just going to get worse without without any, you know, basically being rudderless, I think. You know, I think this is going to get, it's just going to get really bad. I don't think there's going to be a mass surrender or anything like that. I don't think there's going to be a mass pullback. But I think there's going to be a combination of guys surrendering, guys running away, throwing their weapons down, fighting amongst one another. Um, you know, it, it, it really depends on, one, how successful Prigozhin is and for how long. I mean, if, if they, if they you know, so a helicopter gets lucky, gets a lucky shot and kills Prigozhin in, you know, an hour from now, I think, you know, the Russians will recover, uh, although, albeit, you know, not well. But um, if, if he's able to hold this going for several days, I think it's going to have a profound impact on the war. Um, uh, Wagner apparently has now come out and said, quote, um, 
Papia, Putin uh, has made the wrong choice. Uh, that's worse for him. Soon we will have a new president. So if that is uh, verified, and I believe <laughs> that we, we haven't verified it, but I, it looks like the source is legit and it looks like that's genuine. If it is, uh, that seems to answer the question of how far he's planning to go. It looks like he is, is going to remove everybody, including at least that's his goal. We believe he is, uh, at least he has recon that is at least halfway to uh, Moscow, so he's gotten about halfway there, at least uh, recon, that's not his main forces. We've talked about logistics and how right. quickly you can actually move forward with um, uh, um, Commander McMillan, who did anticipate that they could be there within about 12 hours, so uh, it looks like it's going to be interesting. We also have reports of soldiers recording messages uh, from the front lines in Ukraine saying that they support uh, Prigozhin, so uh, which... Wow. Yeah, if that's coming out, I mean, anyway, so it's a, it's a good question, what do you do if you're a Russian soldier? Part of you is probably tempted to do that, he's popular, and if he's sitting there saying, I'm fighting for uh, Russian soldiers, which is what he's saying, and he, he's really hitting that message hard, uh, they're going to want to support him. It, it's possibly their own deaths if they go public and do this, but on the flip side, so many of them um, have felt like their lives have been thrown away, they may get away right. with it, so um, right. we'll see what, yeah, because yeah, because yeah, we're talking about what like the estimate the 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 estimates seem to be you know, between wounded and killed around two hundred thousand. That's insane. Which which by the way another another thing not that it's it's been called into question. You you argue with these people, which is an idiotic thing to do, which is why I do it just <laughs> as much as you do. <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. well, yeah. I've, I, well, I've gotten into it with a number of people who say that, the, you know, you can't believe all these numbers. And it's like, well, this is how we know these numbers. Uh, Prigozhin has essentially confirmed the Ukraine numbers. So uh, according to uh, Moscow, I believe Russia has lost about 10,000 to 12,000 troops in uh, Ukraine. According to every source outside of that, it's closer to 250,000 casualties uh, for the, the Russian well, well, side. And, and, the, and the easy way to tell, we know what he went in with. They, you know, uh, um, we know how much how many forces went into Ukraine, how many were moved into Ukraine, and we know how we know a pretty good idea of how big the call up was, and we know what's left in Ukraine, and it's a simple math. I mean, we know where the units are. There's satellites. There's ground intelligence. There's radio. You know, there's there's communi- You know, there's com traffic. It's really not that hard to figure out uh, how many people there are and where they are, and. Um, and so, they, yeah, it's just simple math. It's like, well, you started, you know, say out of that 279, they originally went in with about 190,000. Uh, they sent in, before the, before the buildup, they, they sent in another 40,000. And then they put it, they, they recruited about 300,000, and the bulk of them went into Ukraine. And there's like 270,000 left. That means that 200 and something yeah. thousand are gone. And that doesn't mean they're all dead. But they are dead or, or wounded and out of action. Well, I think the best evidence for the fact that it, they've suffered those kind of losses is that Prigozhin is halfway to Moscow right now. He announced eight hours ago. I was like, you know, you. I'm going to go on a little journey. And um, here we are. So um, I, I'm. Well, I'm, and, and, one, and one last point before we go off, please. and just to put, just kind of want to build on to what you're saying. I remember early on there were a lot of people who said, "Oh, well, the Russians have like eight, you know, eight thousand modern tanks in storage, and they've got you know twenty thousand old tanks in storage." And we saw for a while there they were re- they were getting some T eighties, you know, into service, you know, back several months, you know, like six eight months ago, and then that stopped, and then it was T seventy twos, and then it was T sixty twos, and now it's T fifty fives. If those T-80s and T-90s were in operational shape, they would be out there right now. They would somebody would be would have kicked out uh, the 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 uh, the two um, Russian brigades that are fighting for Ukraine. Then they would be stopping this now. They don't exist. There, it's 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 a fantasy. Just like back in the day, you were you were, you were, you were and I are similar ages. Back, remember when in the 80s when they told us Russia had 55,000 tanks? Yeah, on paper, they 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 never yeah. had that operationally, and it's the same thing now. It's it's all it's all smoke and mirrors. A T-55, for those, who, I, and I, I know most of you know this, but usually, the basically, roughly, the, the number at the end is the production date. So the, the, the T-55, yeah. from 1955, that was the most modern tank there was available in 1955. And right now, there's a line of those defending Moscow. Um, 
Oh, dear Lord. All right. Well, uh, Joe, once again, thank you so much for coming by. Could you uh, just uh, quickly, you know, let our audience know where they can find you and uh, uh, more about you and just anything that, that you think uh, that you would like to let them know? Sure, sure. My channel is Serious Mind. I haven't made any videos in quite a long time. I keep getting motivated and then get too busy, but I'm trying. I desperately want to make more content. Um, the the Breakfast Club, which became the Dinner Club, which is now the Breakfast Club again. Uh, we haven't been broadcasting, but we uh, uh, um, got that funk. Gave up control of it to uh, to Raven, to Raven J. And she's planning on doing some broadcast, so so look for us there. Uh, so the Breakfast Club channel and Raven J, one of those two places you can find me, or my own if I ever get off my ass and make any videos again. I, I find I am most motivated to do videos when I am most busy doing other things. It's a it's a uh, um, always all right. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just sort of as a quick a reminder to those of you just joining us, I, and I think you know the, the world is sort of waking up to what's happening. Uh, this this is real is the only thing that we know has come out of uh, an unnamed source in the U.S., uh, an unnamed U.S. official. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Wagner has, in fact, invaded Russia. We know they've made progress. Uh, we are, at this point, uh, uh, extremely confident uh, that they have taken Rostov and that there has been a number of uh, Russian military units that have surrendered, if not joined. We also know, we have uh, reports that some Russian military has been joining. We have multiple reports of both Air Force and Ground Forces refusing to fire on Wagner. We haven't been able to confirm any of those. We don't know. You get that kind of stuff. And it may be you know, one or two people refuse to fire because they've never been in combat and they're terrified of war. And all of a sudden you get, you know, 16 reports of an entire brigade refusing to fire. We don't know, but there are definitely reports saying that that has not happened. Uh, we believe that at a minimum his recon has now made it halfway to um, Moscow, leaving about 5,000 uh, kilometers left. Uh, if he continues at this pace, he can cross five, five, that. Five, five, 500. 500. Thank you. Thank you. That's an important. That extra zero does matter. Um, uh, yeah, we believe he can cross that, um, you know, in between six to 12 hours, depending on how he's pacing and how he's bringing up his logistics behind him. Uh, at any rate, there is a small... Uh, Small, we don't know. There is a, a number of tanks and armored personnel carriers that have been uh, uh, deployed in defense of Moscow. They've shut down all of the roads in and out and focused primarily on the roads from the south, which is what he would be taking up. Uh, Putin has come out and said that these are treasonous attacks and has called on all Russians to uh, defend the motherland. Meanwhile, Prigozhin has said that he intends to... Um, uh, well, that uh, Putin has made the wrong choice and that soon we will have a new president. So it does appear that the two are um, uh, <laughs> diametrically opposed. We have elements of the Russian military. We don't know what's going on. We do believe Ukraine is going to seize uh, this as an advantage and uh, probably press an attack while Russia is very confused and their military doesn't know where to go. We know Lukashenko has sent his family out of Belarus. They have landed in Turkey, where presumably they will be safe. We do not know where Lukashenko is or what his intentions are, but given that he can stay in place in power only with the help of a Russian military that appears to now have other priorities, uh, we believe there's a very real possibility for unrest, if not collapse, in Belarus. Uh, Joe Serious Minded has joined us for tonight, which we really appreciate, and Titan has dropped a link to his channel in the live chat. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Joe, it is always a delight to see you, so thank you very much for coming by, and um, look thanks, forward to catching for, up with you. Thanks for having me. If, if you have a little time over the next couple of days, which uh, none of us seem to have, and you and I uh, share very similar circles, and we're always so busy, I would love to catch up with you off air. And um, But at any Absolutely. rate, we really appreciate having you come by. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and we will update uh, as is needed. But right now, what we are looking at is a, a military force attempting the overthrow of the Russian government and uh, making a very serious run for it. And we anticipate significantly more news within uh, six to 12 hours. We hope you will like, subscribe, and follow in time. Uh, we will do 
do our best to make sure you always have the most accurate information as quickly as possible. Join us on the Discord to keep up with that there, and we will see you all in our next update, which could literally be before the credits are done rolling. It, it, don't <laughs> laugh. It's happened It's happened probably other, in the history of the time. It's probably happened eight or nine times where literally credits and then something big in the middle of credits. But... Um, and then it, it seems to happen more often when we joke about it. So we'll see if tradition holds true. Thank you again, Joe. Thank you to everyone. And we will uh, see you soon, I'm sure.